In Luke chapter 2, in verse 40, and the child grew, speaking of Jesus, he waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they supposed him to have been in the company when a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said, meaning Jesus, unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Our topic today is that, taking care of business. <laughs> taking care of business. You may be seated. Thank God for all of you, amen, being here today and being a part of this church, amen, for your faithfulness throughout this year. Thank you. For all those who are watching online, I've got a lot of texts today of those that are homesick, but amen. Thank God for our online service, amen. Bill, everything working up there? we got a lot of people watching. Oh, Phil's up there. All right, Phil, amen. Mom's watching, so you better get it right because she'll text you while you're up there. Turn it up, amen. Um. My wife, Deb, she's, she's homesick today. She wasn't feeling well. We've had people calling for the flu with the flu and stuff. So, amen. I thank God they stayed home. Hallelujah. Amen. As we approach another year, a new year, I love new years because they allow us to reflect on the past year and establish some goals for the coming year. I truly believe God has spoken to this church and into my life that we can look forward to an increase in our lives in many areas this coming year. But increase doesn't come easily. Increase comes with a cost. Whatever you do in God, and for God, amen, there's... Amen. A, a cost that comes with it. It's nice to just be recipients of the blessings of God, but in God's kingdom, it doesn't work that way. Amen. He prepares you and gets you ready for the blessing that he will give you. And I was seeking and asking God, God, what is it? What, what is it that you want from your people? And he said this, that we must be good managers of his kingdom. Managing is another word for the biblical word that is oftentimes used of stewardship. And you have to understand stewardship in the context of when uh, it was written back in Jesus' day and even in the Old Testament. A steward was someone that you entrusted uh, something to. In those days, uh, if someone were an owner and he were to buy land, and it wasn't land that he was going to live on, it was just going to be land that he was going to use as a business proposition. He would buy that land, and then he would make sure that uh, something was grown on it, amen, or livestock would be on it, or farming would be done, and then, amen, at harvest time, they would of course, reap that and sell it and make a profit off the land. But the problem was in those days that, amen, traveling was very difficult. You might live, you might buy land one area and live in another area, and so you can't come and manage it. 
You're the owner. So what you have to do is you have to hire a steward, or what we call a manager. And you entrust your land to this steward. And this steward has the responsibility then to make sure that everything happens on time. Amen. That the land is worked. That the seed is sown. That laborers are hired. That they're looked over to make sure they're doing their job. Amen. Make sure things are getting watered. Make sure, amen, things are keep, being kept up and clean and weeds are being pulled. Make sure that the harvest is coming forth and if adjustments had to be made along the way, this steward was responsible for all that. Even though it was not his land and even though the owner wouldn't come back until harvest time. Which means the owner may leave responsibility to the steward and not come back for eight to nine months. And when he comes back, he's expecting a profit. He's expecting the harvest to have grown, picked, amen, and ready to go to market. Which means then the relationship between a landowner and a steward had to be very close because the steward, amen, had to treat the land as his own. Depending on how well he worked and what he did, he would receive then a reward from the landowner. The biblical word of stewardship could be defined as utilizing and managing all resources God provides for his glory and the betterment of his creation. I want you to know that when God saved you, he didn't just save you to be recipients of salvation. Certainly that is one of them. But he also saved you to be managers in his kingdom, in God's business. I want to ask you today, are you known for taking care of the Father's business? Could you be a better manager of what belongs to God? I know I can so I'm preaching this message to me today, amen, but I know I'm getting you too. Watch this. You are really known by what you are. You see, a lot of people say they're this and they're that, but we really know by where you're at, what you do, and how you carry yourself. Notice that they were already a day's journey away from Jerusalem. They were there for Passover, amen, and they... Uh, did the obligation of Passover, and they're on their way back to Nazareth. And, and in those days, you traveled in groups and company, amen, so you would be safe from robbers on the travel. They must have assumed that when they left Jerusalem that Jesus was with them, and they found out after a day's journey, perhaps they were getting ready to camp for the night, amen, and they found out, where's Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Is he over here? He's over there. And come to find out, nobody saw Jesus. So they decided the next day we got to go back to Jerusalem and find him. Amen. And so they, they go back and they finally find him after three days in the temple or in the temple courts. And they said to Jesus, amen, Mary says, your father and I have sought for you sorrowing. Amen. We've been stressing. We've had anxiety. We've had tears trying to find you, Jesus. Have you ever lost a child? Amen, at the mall or something, you're messed up, the child's messed up, everybody's messed up. Amen, until you find that child. It always, it always makes me laugh when a, a parent is crying, and then when they find the child, they spank them. How dare you get away from us? <laughs> Amen. And, and, and so they came to Jesus almost questioning him and, and, and almost rebuking Jesus. We sought you sorrowing. Jesus says, how is it that you sought me? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? You are known by what you are. They should have known if anywhere Jesus was going to be, he was going to be in the house of the Lord. He was going to be in the temple. He's going to be at the temple gates. Amen. Did they forget who Jesus was? Amen. That Jesus says, how is it that you were looking for me? Jesus at this time is 12 years old. Amen. He's one year away from being considered a man, and amen. But he's in the temple. He's in the house of God. Watch this. Where he belongs. Where he feels at home. A place that he yearns and, and wants to be at. A place he loves to be at. A place that is set aside for prayer and set aside for hearing the word and learning the word of God. And, and a place where he can receive wisdom about the Father and wisdom about God. 
I can imagine Jesus knowing that one day he would be the Passover to end all Passovers. He was watching them bringing in the lambs and killing the lambs and, and how they dissected the lambs and the blood that was shed. And, and Jesus is learning and, and he's absorbing. Where else would Jesus be? Uh, because he was about his father's business. Not Joseph's business. Notice he doesn't even make reference to Joseph. I must be about my father's business, my heavenly father, the one who sent me. Amen. Because I'm the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. Oh, my. You see, here, here's what it shows, that it would appear that as they went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, as soon as they met the obligation of Passover, they left. Oh, my. Isn't that what we often do? We do just enough to meet the obligation with God, but then we leave. Uh, we, we do the minimum. We do just enough. Okay, that should be good enough for God. I got other stuff I need to do, and then we leave. But Jesus loved being there. He didn't want Passover to end. He wanted to be around the temple. He wanted to hang out. Amen. Jesus later said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Where else would I be but in the house of prayer? Where else would I be but in my father's house? Where else would I be where the word is being spoken? Where I can talk, amen, to the, the rabbis and, and those that are learning the word and the Levites and, and learn all that I can get from God. It, it shows where his heart was. His heart was about taking care of business. Let me ask you this question, Dave. Where would someone find you? Oh, yeah, we know, we know him. You can find him at home. He's always home. Mm. Oh, yeah, you can find her at work. She's always working. She's a workaholic. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I won't say your sex on this one. You can find them at the mall. They like to go shopping. Mm. Oh, yeah, him. You find him down at the gym. He's down there about three or four hours a day. Working on his body. Uh, but will someone say, you can find them in church. You'll find them in prayer. You'll find them studying at the library. You probably go down to the bookstore and find them, amen, studying the word. We are known by who we really are, not by what we say. You see, how did they not know? I asked, Lord, how did they not know? This is... This is Joseph and Mary. They've been visited by angels. Hey Amen. They saw this miraculous birth. They, they've been raising this, this, this perfect child who, who obviously has been a blessing and perfect obedience to their parents. How did they not know where Jesus would be? And this is it. Because sometimes we get too common with Jesus. Mm. We get too common. And so this is why it's easy to just give God our minimums and, and not be about the Father's business. Because we've lost some passion and some heart for God. Amen. Now that we're saved and we've made it in. But, but to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind means you love him and you want to do more. You want to go the extra mile with him. Oh, yeah. Say, they, they saw the, the miraculous visitations, but... All by angels, but now they get too familiar with Jesus. Woo! This we we got to check ourselves. Don't you get too familiar? Mm. How is it that we get used to always coming late to church? Oh, Jesus knows me. He knows my struggle in the morning. He knows. That's getting too common. Jesus knows my, 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 my handicaps. He knows I have issues. But you never want to overtake and overcome your issues? You see, we get too common that Jesus will just accept who I am, the way I am. And yet, amen, we never try to be better or to give more to God. New Year's, ending of years, gives a chance to reflect. Have I become too stagnant with God? Have I been too common with Him? Have I gotten to the place where I'm really not taking care of the Father's business? Amen. I just do the normal thing. Amen. I, I'm content just making a church once or twice a month. Uh, God understands me. He knows what I'm going through. No. He wants us to be managers. He wants to be good stewards. 
of all of our time, not just your finances, but your time, your effort, your giftings, your talents, your abilities. He gave them to us. And he says, be good managers of what I've given you because I've given it to you for his business. Oh, do you have a desire to grow in God? You say, here's the problem with growing. You know it's going to stretch you. You know it's going to inconvenience you. You know it's going to mess with your schedule. Even if your schedule is, I'm just going to stay home and watch TV. But it messes with, amen, what we like. It, it messes with our comfort. We know that if God asks us to do something and we say yes, oh, it's going to mess things up. But I want you to know, everybody that God has asked to do something, initially, they start making excuses. Moses made excuses. Amen. Elijah made excuses. Jeremiah made excuses. Abraham made excuses. They all make excuses. But here's the thing. Eventually, they get to the place where they say, yes, Lord. It's okay. I get it. I've done it. Hey, man, God asked you to do something. Ooh, I don't know, God. Mm, maybe not now. Check back with me, Lord, next month, next year. Amen. Hoping God forgets. God don't forget. He, doesn't, he, he has plans for you. He knows what he wants out of you. He knows what he's gifted you to do. Amen. And he's relentless in you operating what he's called you to do for his kingdom. Eventually you get to the place where you say, yes, Lord. And then you look back and you say, thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. Have you abandoned new assignments? That God wants you to do in managing his kingdom? Are you managing what God has given you to the point that it pleases him? You see, we manage stuff, but we don't manage it to the point where I know I please God. You see, Jesus was more concerned about the business of the Father in heaven than the earthly father. In other words, Mary says, uh, your father and I have sought thee sorrow. Jesus didn't even pay attention to that. Don't you know I must be about my father's business you see that's where we get messed up we get more concerned about the earthly things amen that we push the heavenly things aside but God says take care of the heavenly kingdom and I'll take care of your earthly kingdom mm. it's interesting I'm not going to go into the parable today but you know the parable of the talent Jesus gave one so many talents, another a second so many talents, and then he gave one one talent. And just, just like a steward would do, the owner would come back to the steward and look for his profit. What did you do with what I gave you in my business? And the one buried his one talent. And he said, here, I've given you back which was yours. Amen. The, the owner says, what? You couldn't even put it? You didn't have enough effort to put in the bank and at least get me some interest? Everyone else doubled the talent. They, what did they do? They went to work. They took the talent and they managed it and made it double. But the one, amen, he says, you no good servant. You couldn't even do a minimum amount and at least get some interest on it. Mm. He says, amen, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, in God's economy, in his kingdom, amen, he's looking for a profit. He's looking for a return. Amen. You may not think you have much ability. You may not think you have much talent. But let me tell you, whatever it is God has given you, he's expecting a return on it. And God has blessed you. Amen. God has strengthened you. God has talented you. He's given you ability. Amen. God does it all. Amen. He, he gives us everything we need for every assignment he gives us. Oh, yes. And so we see here, amen, that God is looking for a return. But we have to have a mindset that I want to be a better manager in God's kingdom. Oh, yes. Understand this. God owns it, and I manage it. You have to start right there. I want you to say that with me right now. God owns it, and I manage it. Oh, yes. I know we say, well, I did this. I made this. If we took one of these benches right here, amen, there's a lot of craftsmanship in that. Someone had to carve that out. Someone had to know how to do laminate. Someone had to know how to sand. Someone had to know how to measure, how to nail, how to glue. Amen. Someone had to learn how to do all of that. But guess what? Nobody created it. 
God is the only one that creates something. God is the one who gave that person the ability. He gave them the wood. You can't make wood. Amen. God had to provide the wood. He had to provide the trees. He had to make the way. He had to get the right wood and everything to happen so that the work could be done. God owns everything. He owns you. And he says, manage you. God owns everything. I know I like to say this is my tie and my jacket, but it's God. Because you know what? God can take it away. No, no, this is my jacket. Uh-huh. And that nail that's hanging out over there by the door, when you rip your coat on it, you'll see whose it is. Mm. Oh, yeah. Psalms 24 and 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Isn't it interesting that in the beginning God created everything in Genesis and then he creates man of the last of his creation to let everybody know he made everything. Adam didn't make nothing. But after he made everything, he said to Adam, now Adam, I'm going to leave it to you to manage it. You work it. You keep it nice. Try to take it to the next level. Put your heart in it, Adam. Do everything that I have given you and be a good manager of what I have given you. You see, here's why. If you don't see everything you own as God's, you won't manage it well. You ever get, you ever borrow something from somebody? It's not yours, but you borrowed it. Usually you take care of that thing because you want to return it, amen, not broken. Don't you hate it? You borrow someone's tool, amen, and you start using it, and then it breaks. Like, oh, man, I knew that was going to happen. And so then we get an attitude. Why do you give me this broken tool? Hey, man, this tool didn't do me no good because you don't want to be blamed, hey, amen, that you broke it. And he's going to make you pay for it. That's why I borrowed it in the first place. I couldn't afford one on my own. Uh, God owns everything. He says, now manage it. So when you understand God knows everything, you take extra care. To manage it. You'll, you'll think about everything. You'll, you'll think about the dollar you spend. And am I being a good manager with this dollar about what I'm getting to spend right now? Oh, my. It's clear. Watch this. It's clear then that if God created everything and then told Adam to manage it, it's clear that man was created to work and manage. Oh, yes. And to work and manage all that God has created. It's a fundamental principle of biblical stewardship. And you have to understand that or you won't take care of God's business. He owns everything. You're just a manager. Mm. Stewardship expresses our obedience regarding the administration of everything God has placed under your control. Have you ever taken inventory of everything that God has given you? Probably not, because we don't see it as God giving it to us. We see it as ours. But take inventory today of everything God has given you. Take inventory in your closet. Take inventory as you walk around where you live. Take inventory, amen, of everything in your car. Take inventory, amen, of your, of your body. Take inventory of everything God has given you. And then go to his ta your talents and your abilities and your education and all that he has given you. It all belongs to God. It's saying, God, I'm going to take everything, amen, that is yours, and I'm going to manage it well. I don't have right of control of anything, God. It all belongs to you, but I want to manage it well. Sometimes we like to take, amen, credit for things we do. But Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18 says it like this. And you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have given me this wealth. But remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. They may, he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. You know why God wants to give you wealth and give you power to get wealth? Because it establishes his covenant. Amen. He spoke blessings to Abraham. He says, your heirs, your seed will be blessed above all in the earth. So when he gives us power to get wealth, he's fulfilling his promise and covenant to Abraham. And you and me are Abraham's children. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. But management, 
requires responsibility. That's why we like to run from when God tells us to do something because we know we're responsible. But we are called by God to manage what belongs to God. Amen. Here's the thing. It, it so amazes me how God has built his kingdom. He built his kingdom on training, okay, basically a handful. We, I mean, we look, at the, we look at the 12 disciples, and one of them was the devil, so we really had 11. Amen. And, and, and then some other followers that came around 120 on the day of Pentecost. But, but he basically did his, his most personal training basically with 12. And then after three years of training, he leaves and says, now build the kingdom. Amen. You don't have a company anywhere that would do that. Amen. That would look at that and say, that is a recipe for failure. Amen. But, but and, and, and when you look at the Gospels and you see who Jesus picked, you say, Jesus, you, you picked some messed up guys. They were insecure. They were jealous. They were always fighting for position. Amen. Some of them were rebellious against you, and yet you stayed with them and you built a kingdom around it. Because all God is looking for is some that will have some responsibility. Uh, you see, God isn't concerned about all the talent and ability. He's just looking for some committed folks. Uh, what Jesus really did for three years is he found out who were committed and who wasn't committed. The, he, I believe Jesus wanted to pick the rich young ruler. He says, sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and follow me, and I will give you riches in heaven. The man went away sorrowful. I believe God had a position for him in the kingdom. He said, I'm going to make you a top manager in my kingdom, but he turned it down. How many times does God get turned down? How many times have we turned down God from certain assignments? He says, I want to entrust this into your care. I want to develop you so that you can develop my kingdom. Amen. And I will even give you rewards and enjoyment while you're managing my kingdom. Oh, yes. But management is accountability. Oh, yes. Jesus went back. I mean, in the parable, the owner went back, and it was time. What did you do with what I entrusted in your care? And then he blessed them. Amen. That did well. Oh, yes. Well, one day we're going to have to give an account to God. For everything that he has put in our care to manage. That's why he's going to hand out rewards to some and some won't receive any. Because he's going to check and see if you are accountable with what he gives you. With management, there's great reward. There's great reward with management. Amen. Colossians 3, 23, 24. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Jesus. In Matthew 25, 21, he said to one of those stewards, he said, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I can tell you this, one of the greatest rewards is when you say, Yes, Lord. And you go forth and do all you can to manage something as well as you can. Is a joy that comes out of knowing you please God. God will let you know that he is pleased. And he'll say to you, well done. Thy good and faithful manager is what he'll say. He says, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. That's amazing to me. I've been faithful over a few things. But now you'll give me rulership over many things. Because here's the hardest thing to find in the kingdom of God. It's not talent. It's not ability. It's not education. It's faithfulness. Amen. I, I got a thousand ideas of things to do in the kingdom. But everything rises and falls on leadership. Amen. I can't do everything, so, amen, I seek and ask God, God, show me the leader. Amen. And, and, and here's the worst thing you can do is look for people who have talent and ability and anointing and all that. But if they're not faithful, you're going to have a vacant position. They're going to be hit and miss. They're on sometimes and off sometimes. Amen. They, they, they don't do good and well doing. Amen. In season, out of season. You got to catch them when they're in season. Amen. And then be ready to take it over when they're out of season. He says, faithfulness is what you have to look for. 
Faithfulness is what I need in my kingdom. Faithfulness. He can give you anointing. He can give you, amen, the supernatural over your natural. God can do all that. But one thing God cannot give you is your faithfulness to him. Your managing, amen, is all based on, amen, your faithfulness. Oh, yes. Do you manage things well? I'm reminded of a story I read about in a book once. And in this story, it talked about this guy who would be the, the final interview for this company. You know how it is. You get the first layer of interview, and then it moves up to the next interview, and the next interview in a larger company. Hey, man, and they look at your resume, and they check your references and all that. But the final interview was this one guy. And they were amazed how good he was because... Whoever it is that he gave the final approval to a company, the company, they ended up being the best employees. They were so good that, that other companies would try and hire these people away from this company. And then there were people that looked so good on paper and, amen, they looked like they had everything together. They had the nicest dress. They, they were polished in their interview, amen, but some of those he wouldn't hire. And here's what he did. He would go to them, he'd give them a quick five-minute interview, and he says, Let's go down. How did you get here today? Oh, I drove my car. Let's go look at your car. And by looking at the car, he could find out if he would hire them or not. He said, can I get you to open the front door? I don't have to go in. And he would look in. Trash on the floor. Amen. Banana peel. Could you open the back door, please? And open the back door. Oh, yeah. Last week's McDonald bag is still sitting back there. Could you pop your trunk for me? Stuff everywhere, amen. Person would be all embarrassed. He said, I'm sorry. You can't work for our company. Because if you can't manage what you have, you can't manage what we have. Mm. I know y'all going to race out of here when I give the final prayer and go watch. I'm not going to look at your cars today. Amen. Amen. You see, God entrusted that to us. If you have a car today, I've heard the testimony. God gave me this car. It was a miracle. Amen. I was able to get it with $1 down. But then God gave it to you. But it's dirty, trashy, tore up. What happened? If God gave it to you, what is he saying? Manage it. Take care of what I gave you. Amen. Why would he give you another car? Why would he give you a newer car if you don't take care of what he gives you? You see, it's a principle. It's a principle. It's a principle that God is saying, can you manage the little stuff? You see, here's what God is after. He wants us to manage well so he can bless us with more. But here's another reason. It's not just so you can call yourself blessed because here's what he wants to do. He wants to use you to bless somebody else. But here's the thing. If you don't understand good management, you can actually bless someone into hell. Hear me what I say. You see, if I call a two-year-old up here and I pull $100 out of my pocket, which I don't have, but if I pull a $100 bill and gave it to this child, that child doesn't know the value of that $100. That child will turn, tear on, chew on it, and then drop it and walk away. And you'll be looking at it like, oh, my, my $100. You know why? They don't understand the value of it. They don't understand the management of $100. God is the same way with us. He wants to bless you to bless someone else. But if you don't understand management, you'll bless someone that doesn't understand how to handle your blessing, and you will mess them up. You have to understand management in the kingdom in order to rightly bless somebody. Or you can bless them past the point of their ability to manage and it can cause trouble in their life. It's all about how we manage what God has given us. 2016 is going to be the year we manage well. Oh yeah, we're going to manage well individually. We're going to manage well as a church, and we're going to manage well in the kingdom of God. We have to understand that increase is directly related to the management of God's kingdom. In our text today, and this is my final scripture in Luke 2 and 52, this whole context here ends like this. 
And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He says, don't you know I must be about my father's business? And what does it say? He increased in wisdom and stature with favor and favor with God and with man. God wants to use you to be a blessing to someone. I can tell you one of the greatest disappointments as a pastor is when you see someone, especially in the church, who has a need and we can't meet the need. And we have to turn them away and say, I'm sorry, we don't have it. And we try to find other resources and we don't have it. And then you watch on the news and this organization was able to do this and this organization was able to do that and this was able to do that. And it says, Lord, what about us? How come we can't do that? How come we can't show the love of, of Christ, amen, by being a blessing to those in need. And you know what? He let me know. It comes down to management. Amen. Your kingdom opportunities are directly related to kingdom management. Oh, sometimes I get people coming to me, Pastor, I want to do this. Pastor, I want to do that. Amen. And, and so they want to advance in the kingdom, but they don't want to go through management training. Mm, well, amen. All right, you want to lead the prayer? We'll let you lead the prayer. But I want you to come down here Saturday and stack some tables and chairs. Oh, no, I can't. I can't do that, Pastor. You ain't ready. He ain't ready. You don't have a servant's heart. Don't you understand that's just as much serving God as it is praying in front of the people? Are you praying just to be seen? <laughs> to make a name for yourself? You want kingdom opportunities? You got to have kingdom management. In January, we're going to be teaching on managing well. That's going to be our theme for January, manage well. We're going to increase everyone's management skill in the kingdom of God. It's going to be a time of fasting. It's going to be a time of prayer. And it's going to be a time of instruction. We'll have more information and, and a calendar and everything for you next Sunday. But I want you to begin to prepare. Amen. There's 31 days in January. I want each and every one of you to fast 21 of those 31 days. We're not going to do it all at the same time because every time we have a January fast, all those who have January birthdays come to me and complain. It ain't fair. And I feel you. It's not fair. Amen. Church is on a, on a solemn fast, and you got to go sneak out to have dinner on your birthday. Amen. So pick your 21 days out of the 31 days in January. Mark them on your calendar. Take time this week to ask God. Pray to God what kind of fast does he want you on. Amen. 21-day fast is an extended fast. It should be some type of a partial fast, like a Daniel fast. But maybe God wants you to take three days in there where you're only having liquids or maybe some absolutes or a part of your 21 days. Whatever it is that God has touched your heart to do, but seek him to do it. See, God, I want to be a better manager. I want to manage well. I'm ready for fasting and prayer and instruction so I can manage well. So I can launch into this year, amen, being a better manager of your kingdom. Even the things you already do, can you do it better? What you already do, can you take it to the next level? Amen. Whatever God has you to do now, can you take it to the next level? I know I can. I can be a better pastor. I can be a better preacher. I can be a better teacher. Amen. My jokes can get better. It can all get better. Amen. Doing it better. Doing it greater. Doing it for the Lord to the utmost. Amen. People walk through here and they feel the love of God. Begin to realize, Lord, how come you constantly have me preaching on, amen, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. Even sometimes I get sick of it. Love your neighbor again, Lord? You know why? Is it because first, you got to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You see, your ability of managing his kingdom, which takes sacrifice, is directly related to how much you love God. Will you love him with everything? Will you love him when it's sacrifice? When you love him just because of sheer obedience? Will you love him, amen, because he's been so good to you? Will you love him because you realize he has called me to be a manager in his kingdom, not just to be saved? In our Western culture, I don't know how this happened, but the church has come a place where you just receive from God. But that's not biblical. Churches where we come together, we build each other up to go out and get worn out managing folks. Anybody in here ever had a management position on your job, company, something? 
Folks will wear you out. Folks will wear you out. I don't know how anyone manages without the Holy Ghost. Amen. But God says, I'll give you the resources. I'll give you the wisdom. I'll give you the ability. I'll give you the talent. I'll give you the, the super on your natural. I'll give you the anointing. Amen. In the kingdom of God, we can't fail if we just say, yes, Lord. Amen. So remember, amen, be seeking God this week. How many are ready to take it to the next level? Amen. How many are ready to grow in God? Hallelujah. Amen. I know I am. God owns it, and we manage it. Right? Think about that. Everything you have, God owns. Amen. Everything. The shoes you're walking on, God owns it. Amen. He owns the feet you put your, your, your shoes in. He owns it all. He owns everything about you. Your uniqueness, God owns it. Your personality, God owns it. Your good looks, God owns it. God owns all of that. Your beautiful eyes, God owns it. God owns all of it. Amen. I know some of you got some eye color things on there, but amen. Guess what? God owns that too. He owns the makeup. He owns the jewelry. He owns it all. God owns everything. Hallelujah. The time is now to take care of business. I've often wondered this. Here's one, here's one way you could check. What would it be like at your funeral? Have any of you ever wondered that? Some of you ain't thinking of dying yet, so you're not thinking of that. But I've been to many. Some, amen, people line up to give remarks. When I see that, you know what it lets me know? This person has touched many lives. And then there's other ones where you got to beg people to come up and say something. Is there anybody has anything to say about the deceased? It ain't nice. Let me ask you this. What would they say at your funeral? Wait, let me take that back. Would they come to your funeral? Mm. And if they did, what would they say? Did you touch their lives? Did you take time to help them? Did you pass along wisdom? Did you pray for them? Amen. Did you give them a meal when they were down? An encouraging word? Did you show them love? Because those are all the things people talk about. Did you have some laughs with somebody? Did you spend some time with somebody? Because, amen, that's what everybody talks about. Amen. They don't talk about, amen, how many hours you put in, the position you had on your job, how much money you made. They don't talk about all that. They want to know who's going to get it, amen, but they don't talk about it. Hmm. Yeah. Your management in the kingdom is directly related to that. But even more so, what will God say? When we see Jesus face to face, and he wants to give you a crown, but he can't because we didn't manage well. Uh, we're going to be happy we made it. We're going to be happy we made it to heaven, but there may be some remorse that I didn't manage as well as I could have for my Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's manage well in 2016. That's what I love about New Year's. New Year's are new chances, new opportunities to get it right this time. Hallelujah. Stand with me right now. Repeat after me. God owns it, and I manage it. Hallelujah. This altar is open right now for anyone who needs prayer. Maybe you need to come down and reaffirm your commitment to God. Amen. Ask them to forgive you. Whatever your need is. Maybe someone today needs to come into the kingdom. Amen. You need to repent and be baptized. Maybe you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost today. You can't do this without the Holy Ghost. Amen. You need God's help. You need God's guidance. You need his direction. But whatever your need is, this altar is open for you right now. Come on down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.